Just uh, go for it. Let's get started. This is uh, uh, Terry Russell, who's president of our, uh, uh, our good friends, the Institute for Science and Engineering and Public Policy. Brought many good speakers to Portland. And Terry's going to be talking today on uh, systems evolution and engineering thermodynamics. <clears throat> so this this is a, uh, a last minute re, uh, redo of a talk I gave at the, uh, uh, what was it called? International Systems Science Society. Yeah, down in uh, down in Corvallis, about a month ago, and uh, and I thought they said, "Hey, you need somebody to pop in here." I go, "Hey, I could do this instead of getting just 15 minutes or 20 minutes to present. I can actually get a something 45 or 50." So, but then of course I looked at it and go, "Like, well, I have to revise it." Of course, <laughs> right? So I did that a little bit because part of it was like I revised it when I was down there because one of the guys was advocating the opposite position, which of course I had to do. Anyway, so uh, it's about how systems evolve, and it's related to what I call engineering thermodynamics, which is different from standard thermodynamics, if you weren't aware. Uh, quick background, I started in philosophy of science. Uh, I actually went to Berkeley to do astronomy, uh, got into philosophy of science eventually, and not being happy with the scientific worldview. Like everything's deterministic, and like so. Anyway, I morphed into philosophy of engineering. These are kind of my mentors and guys I hung out with. So what I'm going to do here, um, some of this is going to be a little bit deep, dense, and it's going to introduce things you may not be familiar with. As I, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you so what to begin with, and then I'm going to show you where it goes. So what I'm going to be talking about is a paradigm shift from scientific worldview to the engineering worldview. Okay. Engineering worldview I take to be more general, but uh, it's not novel. And <clears throat> There's a thing where uh, uh, I think most of the solutions to these things come out in the practical world and then the theorists, as myself and philosophers, like to talk about it later. But the reality is this stuff comes first. So anyway, uh, Standard economics was scientific economics, right? Supply, demand, means equality. Yeah, well, and then they started seeing this go on, and it's not supposed to be happening. The equilibrium point's just going up, and someone goes like, "Hey, it's the technology, stupid." And everybody goes, "Yeah," but they're still using this uh, these equilibrium models, which have various strange uh, things in. Them. Anyway, so in 1990, Romer writes this thing called endogenous uh, article called endogenous technological change. Because before, all these fluctuations around the equilibrium point were all due to exogenous factors, okay, like a hurricane hits or something. And uh, so you say, no, 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 actually, that's what economy, economies do that. Economies actually innovate and they create wealth and they do things positive. So that was the big revolution which leads to, uh, it was called new growth economics. So, the, and, and I, this shift that he makes to endogenous technological change is the same as the shift from the scientific way of looking at things to the engineering way of looking at things. So technology, all of a sudden engineering becomes a technological enterprise or an engineering enterprise. So we're always trying to make the world better, trying to do things. So it's a different, big shift. Homo economicus, uh, instead of being this perfectly informed, uh, rational uh, chooser, actually ends up being a, an engineer and a problem solver. So one of the things uh, about uh, Romer's thing, they call him, they call him a, the a first post-Malthusian uh, economist. And the main thing is that as these economies grow, they actually uh, uh, expand. And what they're expanding is they're in, they have increasing capacity to perform work. That's the sort of parameter we're going to play with. Uh, so anyways, they increase their activity. They also increase their ability to activity. A lot of people talk about evolvability. So they not only evolve, but they get better at evolving. Okay. Uh, now, yeah, so quick, quick. So, so Paul gives these couple of examples. He said, "Well, like Starbucks, you said you know, have three sizes of cups and you have three sizes of lids, right? Well, now they have one, three sizes of cups, and uh, or yeah, three sizes of drink and one size lid. Because somebody just figured I just changed the geometry. Okay, so it's not rocket science. That's an that's an innovation. It improves the uh, the uh, uh, supply chain, so forth." So, and then he has another one that's about RAM chips. He says, uh, 10 years ago, I used to have to pay 100 bucks to put another gigabyte of RAM on my computer. Uh, but now I can get one for 10 bucks. And then he says, and I didn't do anything. 
the point being that somebody in his ecosystem, his economic ecosystem, solved the problem about how to produce branches cheaper that then made it for possible for him to do stuff cheaper, which meant that he could do, you know, like, okay, so you can buy it. So everybody, it has this, this uh, morphing effect of going through the economy. And if you guys are familiar with Kurzweil and all those guys, they're all looking for what's the next accelerating technology. So as these technologies, good technologies move through uh, the economy, everybody kind of changes what they're doing. And there are various ones that have, some are more obvious than others. Uh, so anyway, the, 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 the moral here that I was trying to get to Peter the other day was, so it's in my interest that other people in my ecosystem succeed. Okay, that's very, also a non-Malthusian. Uh, and it, 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 it leads to new politics and new morality. Anyway, I just want to go through this quick. So post, post, so one of the things I have a friend on UCLA says, uh, in my 75 years, said uh, world population has doubled, economic output has increased, has increased eightfold. Double to eightfold, okay? So this is very non-Malthus, okay? <laughs> what it's saying essentially is it is a normally, uh, normal functioning economy, which I don't know what normal is, but normal functioning economy actually produces more wealth, and more opportunity than the population has ever possibly, could ever possibly consume in their lifetimes. So there's always a net predictive thing in economy. This is the new way of looking at it. This is, comes out of this engineering. Terry, area. Yeah. Uh, is this not dependent on fossil fuels? No. Is it, is it, well, here's what I think. So it's not how much land, water, gold you have. It's what you do with it. This is one of the mantras of this. So one of the things is about share, about ideas. So uh, uh, this thing about whether you can consume them or not. If this is one cup of coffee, then you consume it, I consume it, whatever. But you have an idea, like, hey, let's plow our fields. Well, that's an idea that can be shared. Okay, so that's one of the uh, uh, essentials of this. I don't want to get too, so another, I'm going to give another, just where I'm going, uh, is this guy, Ramiz Nam, he's an engineer, came out of, he's a Microsoft, he's a, yeah, software engineer out of Microsoft, wrote this fantastic book, which you know, is called Infinite Resource, the Power of Ideas on a Finite Planet. And it's the same point, uh, essentially, that, uh, that as you, uh, as we innovate and stuff like that, we don't go off the, the edge as the, as the limits of growth people would do. Uh, we, we change how we're doing things. We have a different design. We innovate, and, and that's how we're able to grow and, and develop. Uh, and then along these lines, uh, this guy, uh, Peter Corning, who I have a love-hate relationship with. Not really. I, I really like his stuff. And what he's saying is that the, the way evolution occurs is through these synergistic formation of these synergistic relationships. And synergy is like um, that you and I can do something together that neither one of us could do separately. Okay, and uh, and those are those for him are are uh, developmental. And so, and he talks about about the embodiment of synergy too. And he says if you don't believe that, so here's this uh, here's this computer. <laughs> It has all sorts of synergies embodied in it. Uh, you don't believe it? You should take out one component and see what happens. Okay. So, and it's his latest book. I think it's really. I mean, I agree with everything he has to say, but it's an incredible scholarly contribution. It goes over all these uh, different uh, things about how evolution works. Okay. Very similar uh, symbiotic idea. So, so uh, Lynn Margulis and so what they and it goes into the guy theory. So when. Uh, you know, uh, organisms can form, I would say, I would call it a win-win relationship. They both gain from it and they're able to do something that was not done before. Uh, so just, uh, th this is le leading to rethinking evolution. Uh, this, this is Eugene Coonan, who's one of the guys, probably, I don't know who did it, but the last, one of the 12 people who can claim some major credit for the CRISPR uh, technology. Uh, it's in the National Institute of Health. Anyway, so he's, he was commenting, he said, the state of affairs of the 150th anniversary of Darwin's origin of species uh, is somewhat shocking. This was in 2009. So in the post-genomic era, all major tenets of the modern synthesis, Darwinian synthesis, are, if not outright overturned, replaced by a new and incomparably more complex vision of the key aspects of evolution. So not to mince words, uh, the modern synthesis is gone. The key question is what's next. So any guys are still hanging on to Darwin, don't forget. So this is one of my buddies. Uh, these guys are working the deep sea events, trying to figure out how life came came about from the abiotic to the biotic, if you like. But 
and uh, so Bill says, uh, transition to complex life hinged on a unique endosymbiotic, this is for the mitochondria, and endosymbiotic bioenergetic jump, rather than on natural selection, acting on mutations accumulated gradually among physically isolated fields. So he's very big on this eukaryotic step in evolution, okay? And then he says, uh, if, if Darwinian evolution is supposed to work like a tinker, evolution with mitochondria will, works like a core of engineers. What I mean by that is that uh, eukaryotes are 200,000 times more energetic than any prokaryote ever was, okay? That's a big jump, okay? So that's the sort of thing that's uh, example. So this is his buddy, Nick Lane, He's got a couple of good books out. This is at the Royal Institute. And they're just, they're asking different kinds of questions about the structure and design of life and why are they, that just don't even really come up. Uh, so I've read, so a lot of this that I'm working on is, when I got dissatisfied with the scientific worldview and philosophy of science, uh, morphed into philosophy of engineering, engineering review, I wrote an article there about it. Uh, and what we're looking for, we want a bigger tent. Okay, so um, I, want a, I want a tent in which engineers are really doing what they think they're doing, and, and uh, I'll come back to that. So, the, the, and the part of my thesis here today is that the, what I'm call, what I've been calling philosophy of engineering is in fact the systems engineering uh, philosophy as well. Systems theory is not a scientific theory, it's an engineering theory. And what does that mean? And that's what we want. So, uh, the, the framework, both frameworks, they're, they're post-scientific, so to speak. So science ends up being all what we've called sciences are like special cases, limited special cases within this bigger tent. Um, and and I, there's a formal way, but it, they, so the engineering philosophy or system philosophy subsumes and supersedes all possible deterministic scientific mechanical views. So the, the extrapolation from these sciences to say, oh, therefore the whole universe is deterministic, is a mistake, because none of those, none of the sciences are are, are universal in that uh, So what we want here is a paradigm change. We want the Kuhn's regular paradigm changes were supposedly within science, but what we want is a paradigm change to get us from science to this larger engineering worldview. And an and example, going from the flat earth to the round earth is an example, so we're going to the later better theory, has to be able to subsume and supersede the earlier. Subsume means it can explain everything that the flat earth one did, but doesn't, doesn't end up having to fall off the end of the earth and stuff. To supersede means that it understands it in a new way. And I'll come back to that more. Because the engineering worldview has, is a more sophisticated conceptual system. It has free will in it, has policy questions, has all sorts of questions in it that make sense, that don't make sense uh, in terms of particles and waves and stuff. Okay, so the big issue is going to be what is the relationship between the uh, this systems uh, engineering uh, view of the world and, and science, which I sort of said. So they're all going to be, all the science, all you call science, you know, Newtonian physics, Maxwellian stuff, all these are going to be special cases, uh, limited uh, with boundary conditions uh, in, uh, in this more general thing. Okay, so um, what happens in this too is it's not just a shift in, in uh, it's a shift in how we see the world, it's also a shift in how we represent inquiry. Okay, what is inquiry in the scientific worldview? How do we make sense of that? And what is inquiry in the uh, engineering view? They're different. Uh, in the scientific view, th there's this thing called the spectator view. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm learning about the world, but the world's out there. It's like this objective world out there, and I'm sort of somehow a detached observer, which is a, the, this is the uh, spectator idea. And uh, I, I sh I'm not interfering with that, because I'm interfering with the world, I'm not going to be able to figure out how much my interference, I'm going to track that down. So it's, it's obviously an idealization to say that we're not part of reality, but so the, in the participant view, we're actually part of reality. Okay, so in the engineering view, we're inside of reality. And uh, this is not new. In fact, I think the best, uh, I like John Dew, if you want to read about this, his, his book called The Quest for Certainty is quite good on this. Uh, this is this what I said? So am I investigating the world out there? So what happens though, the question for the scientist is how does the world out there, separate from me, work? For the, the question changes when we go to the engineering review. 
She was like, how do I work in the world? So I know how to do stuff, okay? So you see this a lot in American pragmatism, it's how we're looking for methods and a lot of ways of doing things. And so knowledge, real knowledge, ends up being about how to do things. Now, this is <laughs> Steve Weinberg. He says, isn't it quaint that engineers think that they can change the course of events uh, and I would say restructure reality. Since we physicists know that the course of events is uniquely determined by universal laws uh, everywhere from the beginning of time. That's the scientific view. Yeah. Does anybody believe really So I was talking, goes like, so I've noticed uh, even people who claim everything is predestined that, and that we cannot do anything to change, to change it, look before they cross the road. And, uh, and Stanley Jack is a, so people promoting determinism have lost touch with common sense. Okay, so I want to get a knowledge thing now because this is a great challenge. This guy, Walter Vincente, he's a, a, I think he's still alive actually, an um, aeronautical engineer down at Stanford, wrote this great book a while back called What Engineers Know and How They Know It. So he says, modern engineers are seen as taking their knowledge from scientists and by some occasionally dramatic but probably intellectually uninteresting process, using this knowledge to fashion material artifacts. Is that from this point of view, studying the epistemology of science, theory of knowledge in terms of, from a scientific point of view, should automatically subsume the knowledge content of engineering. And he goes, and he says, engineers know from experience this is not true. Okay, so, it's kind of going after what is the relationship between what we've thought as is engineering, as scientific knowledge, and what we're saying is engineering. This is from engineering a perspective. Technology appears not as a derivative from science, but as an autonomous body of knowledge. Now here's a good example. He says, airplanes are not designed by science, but by art. In spite of some pretense and humbug to the contrary, do not mean to suggest for one moment that engineering can do without science. On the contrary, it stands on scientific foundations, but there's a big gap between scientific knowledge and the engineering project product, which has to be bridged in the art of the engineer. Uh, the creative, constructive knowledge of the engineer is the knowledge needed to implement that art. So, systems engineering knowledge, I'll just put them together, is about how to do things, it's about methods, it's how to create things, scientific knowledge is about how to change the course of events and how to, move, how to evolve or develop reality. Okay, that's what engineers are doing, changing reality. Now, the way I put this is, uh, science is great, but it doesn't tell you how to build an airplane. Science is great, but it doesn't tell you how to build a cell phone. Science is great, doesn't tell you how to build a machine at all. Okay? So science ends up being these tools, uh, essentially tools of the uh, of, uh, engineering. The way we put it is, inst instead of engineering being applied science merely, science, as we've been calling it, is engineering research, properly understood. So I have another piece out on that. I'm going to go in. So, 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 <laughs> point out something pretty obvious. If everything's determined, what the hell's inquiry? Where do you get the idea that science is intrinsically deterministic? That well, that's what is, that's what is going. I mean, that's, I, I'll go into that with you on it, but uh, it's it's pretty obvious, I think. So, <laughs> inquiry. Quantum mechanics. What? Well, yes, I'm I'm there with you on that, but that's where we're going here. Okay. So, so anyway, so no, we're still in classical, classical science at the moment. So, the main thing I would say in a deterministic world, and still you got, I, it's like a Brian Green. I go like string theory. I said, I say, is this determ is this fully deterministic? He says, absolutely. Talk to Sean Carroll at, at Caltech. Hey, is there this whole thing, the big picture, is all fully, fully deterministic? Absolutely. These are the big, the new atheists and all this. And uh, anyway, whether that makes sense or not. I mean, there's, there's, there's arguments for and against this sort of stuff. We have to get a little deeper. So the main point I want to make, Descartes, I don't know if you guys read it, get a little Descartes in your... Yeah, but he, in, in his methodology, he asked this question about trying to, what do I know and what don't I know? And he goes into a whole big thing. And uh, the thing is, the point I want to make is inquiry itself doesn't make sense if everything's deterministic. I mean, what are we inquiring? What do we gain by learning anything? It's all deterministic. And I would go so far to say, if I don't have the freedom, some sort of important freedom, to test my theory, then what confidence I have in my theory? So everything deterministic. So he, the looks at this and he said, well, you know, maybe the, maybe God's a deceiver. 
maybe all this stuff that I'm going through and pretending to test my theories and all deterministic. He said, what? I, you know, and his answer is, well, God wouldn't do that. <laughs> I, have, I have a kind of an unfinished manuscript called Descartes' Nightmare, which is pointing out that if you, in a deterministic world, you just have no confidence at all of what you think you believe. Okay, so quantum theory, as you're saying. So what happens in quantum theory is different. So first of all, quantum theory is essentially says the, the complementarities are very important in it. And it essentially says, well, there was Newtonian mechanics and there was there was Maxwellian mechanics, and uh, and somehow they're both right, but one doesn't reduce to the other. Okay, and I have a so I have my Einstein quote down the line here. I'll give it to you. Anyway. Einstein has this nice nice quote. I use. He says uh, he says in Newtonian mechanics, uh, uh, they ask him what is reality. He says in Newtonian world, we knew what it was. It was it's a point. In space time. Well, how does he mean by that? He's, so, if everything happens, has to happen absolute simultaneity, which was Einstein's point about Newton. He's, everything has to absolute simultaneity. The only way that can happen is everything happens in the same place. So, the Newtonian reality is a point in space time. Then he says, on the other hand, the Einsteinian or the Maxwellian thing, everything's uh, it's just everything's distributed. Now, distributed in space, I can kind of get a sense of that. Distributed in time. That's a little tougher, okay? And in fact, Lee Smolin goes on about this, and neither one of these theories has actually any, time doesn't pass. In the Maxwellian thing, you get Minkowski space where everything's already happened. We just happen to be experiencing it, but everything's already happened. Time, completely time, you know, and in Newtonian thing, nothing happens at all. So anyway, what Wheeler, who I like, um, points out this collapse of the wave function thing. He says like, you know, so we do Schrodinger's equation, all that, and yet this, Describe this potential situation. Well, nothing, unless something triggers or does something, we, they usually think in terms of the observer. Until I make an observation, it doesn't actualize into any any particular future. Uh, so, for him, the, the, the well, I would say the choices that you make, which are also questions you're asking, perhaps about reality, are have to be internal to reality. Uh, inquiry itself is an irreducible embedded embodied feature of the nature of reality itself. And this is this famous little diagram he put together. Uh, there's a great article called Observership is as Genesis, where he's just saying, hey, you don't have observers in the universe, you don't. And from the engineering point of view, I was saying, you don't actually need observers in the human sense of observer. All you need is something that performs work in the engineering sense, something that does something, but that's down the line. Uh, so, as we go, so the inquirer is no longer a detached observer, the spectator. He's an active agent involved in the construction of reality. This is uh, Wolfgang Pauli, one of the In the new pattern of thought, we do not assume any longer the detached observer occurring and the idealizations of this classical type of theory. An observer who, uh, by his indeterminable effects, creates a new situation, very important, creates a new situation typically described as a new state of the observed system. So every time you collapse the wave function, you actually are creating a new future. If you've, you know. But then what they say is that all the choices that you make in your life, they're all contained in your next future. Okay, so everything is just inherent historical aspect too. So uh, Bohr didn't uh, miss this idea about complementarity and its link. I mean, you guys probably have Fujof Kapra's book, The Tao of Physics. So, so this the scientific reality is, is jump here with this a little bit. The scientific reality is uniform, uniformity, Euler's uniformity thing, homogeneity, not in quantum reality. Quantum reality is confusing because it has these two complementary orders at the same time. So this is one of my favorite guys, uh, Josiah Royce, one of the uh, American pragmatist, and, and they call it Royce's criterion of self-referential coherence. So it says that whatever theory you come up with, you say, oh, I just came up with a theory of everything. Well, that theory, you better have you in it. <laughs> you, know? you better be able to account for you having learned it. Okay, how can you, you know, like, oh, I came up with a theory. Oh, you learned a theory. Well, how did you, you know, is that, is the fact that you're in that universe and you learned that theory? Now, if you're not there, then there's a problem. So, and I don't think you are in science, as I pointed out. There's no questions in science, so there's no learning. So what Royce argues is that questions and learnings have to be essential, irreducible aspects of the nature of reality. Okay, and again, we're moving from this scientific idea where I'm, I don't have to talk about, I'm sort of abstracted outside of reality, 
in, in this thing, no, I'm inside of reality, I'm part of reality. This is part of the engineering thing. So problem solving, uh, agents, problem solvers themselves must be essential, irreducible aspects of the nature of reality. I take that to be slam dunk, but we'll see. Uh, and so, it, and, and this the idea that we're inside uh, is subsumes and supersedes the previous thing. Uh, so this is how, this is a w one way of understanding how the engineering view understands the scientific view as a special case. Because in some sense, I get to oh, talk about what's happening on Mars. I don't think I'm influencing that right now. But we're in the same universe. And I was saying that, uh, science and engineering research. Okay, so uh, another guy along this line, uh, Petrovsky, um, and, and argues that engine, you know, everything, <laughs> everything you thought was this detached spectator scientific research can only be made sense of as part of a participant engineering development. This is kind of subtle in a way, but they're saying, okay, if there's knowledge, we have knowledge of the world, you can't account for that knowledge in terms of science. The only way you can account for it is in terms of this you know, bigger thing where you actually have the possibility of testing and inquiry and so forth. So everything that, you, that we've called science is really properly understood. And this, I said, when we supersede, we're going to understand it in a new way. So what science has been doing is actually uh, can only be made sense of within a larger epistemological, within a larger theory of knowledge. This is Vincenti's as well. Do you mean like you have to be able to build it or reproduce it or create it yourself? No, no, it's like no, it's like the round earth understanding the flat earth thing. I mean, it's just basically, and they send it in a new way. It's saying what science is really doing is is uh, this gives in a lot of stuff. I don't want to pause off, but it's it's saying that what we've called science is really uh, what you do when you're doing science is you're looking for particular types of relationships and you have to discover them and you have to explore and you have to invent and you have to do a sort of thing you find it. Now, so somebody has to do that. Who does that? It's not some detached thing. It's got to be somebody inquirer actually doing stuff. Okay, so I'm saying that what we do in science is actually a participant activity. You can't get scientific knowledge without getting your hands dirty, so to speak. Okay, that doesn't come out of the scientific worldview. So anyway, what we do is axiomatize this, you know, it's like Euclid's axiom, you can derive everything. Einstein actually said why, that. Why don't you just say that what science needs to have philosophy of science, that science without, you know, self-reflect, without reflecting on its own practice is incomplete. Why does it have to be engineering that's the completion well, of science? That. I'm not going to go, I'm not, you just have to listen for a second. So, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I want to say that the choice that's made in, in uh, quantum theory is not just about actualizing the potential, it's actually uh, uh, doing something in the world. So, so what the scientists are talking about in, in, in quantum theory is, is making an observation is really uh, doing something. It's an action in the world. It's an act in the world. It changes the world when I do it. And I bring about a, a thing. So again, this is a, going from how does the world work to how to work in the world thing. Um, this is a little bit of repetitive. Uh, okay, so then uh, you guys maybe know this guy, Herb Simon. I would count him as one of the early uh, contributors to philosophy of engineering. And uh, so, so I'm going to ask, what is, what is engineering doing? What is engineering problem solving? And he says, this, basically it's an attempt to move from a current state of affairs to a more desirable future state of affairs. Okay, I would say design. For one design, why are we do here's how we're doing it now. We want to move to a better design, a better system. Okay, so that's what we're doing. I'm going to do a better system. So, and better is a key thing because this is values. Okay. So what we're doing in engineering is we're trying to do. We put it as like we're trying to bring about a better world in general. And this is a whole thing. So, if we're going to have progressive, innovative designs, they require the same uh, experimentation, exploration, discovery. You're not going to derive them. Scientific inquiry is not sy systematic in the sense it's been reserved. It's not a logical process. I mean, you got to go out there, you have some ideas, crazy, you got to try something, whoa, look, we found something. Okay, it's not not logical, mathematical. It's it's innovative and it's exploratory and so forth. So it's a different, a different understanding of how inquiry works and it checks out. Whereas a scientific one, which is everything's logical, mathematical, systematic, is just wrong. This is part of Thomas Kuhn's thing, okay? 
So anyway, Simon, Simon kind of puts it, and again, this, this better is very, very important because one of the things that happens in engineering is because it incorporates values as well, it brings this, what we've understood as the sciences and what we've understood as the humanities now are rejoined in this broader engineering view. Okay. I think I'm hearing you say that the value system of the agents can't be discounted in the way that Hall's Metasystems methodology says that the first thing to do is to design your value system, which is going to get implemented by your system. Or in control theory, when we think about how our neural net is going to rewrite its own way yeah. it values, and that it is true that a lot of, you know, but put it this. I mean, I'm going to get into just this. My next slide here. Let me let me uh, a quick answer. So one of the things that's characteristic of, of engineering inquiry that's supposedly not there in science is that, the, that, that what you think the problem is changes by the time you get to the solution. And one of the old aphorisms was when you finally know what the problem was and you found the solution. And a lot of times when you go into an engineering problem, you don't know what the heck the problem is really. I mean, you have some ideas, but you know, like you don't really know what it is. And then you come up with a solution and say, ah, this is a solution. Oh, well, that's what the problem was. So the problem actually develops. So this idea of like, oh, I'm going to say what I'm going to do first and then do it, yeah, that'd be a good scientific one. So anyway, so this is really important. So, so scientists, so if, if things are happening, so what do the scientists do? And uh, I like the existentialist thing, and, and Foreman gets on it, sort of like, here I find myself instantiated in the world. I'm able to do things in the world, but I don't have any script. What am I supposed to do? The continental existentialists are really upset about this because they, you know, the Pope was telling them what to do before, and now all of a sudden they're going like, oh, there's no script. You know, what am I supposed to be doing? Am I, am I being graded? Uh, no, I'm not being great. I'm sorry. So they were like, angst, you know, who am I? What is going on in the world? So I think Americans sort of responded to this. They're like, you mean, I, you mean I have all this potential to do cool stuff? I can do all this creative stuff? And, and you know, like, so that's what Florman goes on to, the existential pleasures of, of engineering. <clears throat> and he really goes deep in it. It's a very good book. Uh, and he has several other books on engineering and engineering education, and values, and all that sort of stuff to follow up on. He was very early on. He's, I think he's passed on now, but he was out writing in the 60s. Uh, so we find ourselves in a script. Okay, this is a way of putting free will. And you guys get a sense of free will. If you get into the Gibbs free energy, you know, Gibbs free energy says, I'm constrained, but I have the ability to act. It's the same thing. These, these are, you can put these together. You know, freedom and determinism are not incompatible. They're just constrained, you know. Like, okay. So, I mean, let's see what we're for. So, uh, so what is the problem of design? Let me just put it this way. How should, I, uh, how should I design the irrigation of my fields? That's the question. How should I design my house? That's a design question. How should I design, how should we design our neighborhood? Uh, how should we design our, uh, our city? How should we design our economy? Should we have tariffs and patents and so we have it? And then how should we design our political system? to make all this stuff work. Well, at that point, you're at Plato's Republic. Plato's Republic is designed for The American Constitution is a design document. It's an experiment, experimental design. Let's try, work, let's try living this way. See how it works. Recursively changeable, okay? So these are all design questions. So I'm sure you guys read Harvard Business Review. Right? My daughter always tells me, she says, Dad, you need to understand that people don't most people don't read as broadly as you do. This is happening, okay? So, like I said, the philosophers come up late, come along late. There's an engineering consciousness coming up in, in uh, Silicon Valley in particular, but other places in business. So basically they're saying, in evolutionary design thinking, it's just thinking like a design designer can transform the way you develop product services. So some of the, some of the people early in philosophy of engineering say, well, the you know, CEO tells you what to do. And, uh, or the government tells you, you know, so the engineers don't really have their own value system. It's like, no, wait, wait, wait a minute. The government is a design system. <laughs> the company is a design system. How should, you, how should we design our business? You go to the venture capitalists. What do they want to know? How are you going to design your business? Who are your, who are your personnel? I don't care what your technology is. That's great. But I want to know, who, you got a good CEO, you got a finance guy, you got HR guys. So the design of the of a business is just the same thing. So what what's what people have seen is this is all one thing. Okay, and the one thing is all unified under an engineering design concept. 
Okay. So I just want to throw this in because it'll come up later. I mean, this, so uh, so engineering knowledge. So as I said, then Sonny says, well, like, science doesn't tell you how to build an airplane. But if I know how to build an airplane, I have some knowledge of how to build an airplane. What kind of knowledge is that? Okay, so if I have knowledge of how an airplane works, that knowledge is not reducible to science. I have knowledge of things. Okay, how about a computer? So I, I can build a computer. I can put it together. We've done it. Okay, a cell phone. Engineers have knowledge of things in the world. All the things that that engineers have knowledge of are created. Okay, things that have been created, and they're created. And so I want to say that anything that's created uh, is not reducible to scientific mechanical knowledge. Okay, very general thing. So this gets into the ontology, like what's the world made up of? So is it safe to say that if, if you make something, if you're the maker, that you have some kind of knowledge about that object? That a scientist, if well, you're just observing an object, you wouldn't understand? Right. So there's a special knowledge that comes yeah. by making an object. Yeah, I think it was Feynman or something who said if I, no, I wasn't Feynman, somebody says if I, I don't understand something unless I can make it, something like that. So well, what is it about making an object that allows you, that, that well, changes keep your listening, understanding? Keep the listening. projection of fear? Okay, I can. <laughs> That's what this is all about. Okay, so one of the things is, is a policy questions become meaningful in, in an engineering point of view. I don't, I don't know where's policy questions in science. I don't see them. So, and this is a guy who's been here. You met him, didn't you? When he was here? Churchman? Here. Yeah, he came and visited here. Yeah, anyway, Wes Churchman came here. He was one of the founders and a good systems theory guy. A book called uh, Systems Theory and Its Enemies, which is very interesting. So anyway, he, he gets this question. This is a great question I'm talking about. It's a design of inquiring systems. I talked to him and said, Wes, this is a great book. And uh, he said, yeah, he said, well, I don't get a little history of it. Anyway, I, I, and he asked him, it's kind of a meta question. This is the evolvability question. It's not like, oh, how do we learn? But how do we design our society so that it learns, okay? And a big part of this now is, is very current. It's called innovation policy. And it goes to a company too. How do I, what's my innovation policy in my company? The employee comes up with a really great idea, with an idea. How am I fielding that? How am I developing that? How am I doing that? And in society in general, how are we doing? How are we doing as far as encouraging innovation? Okay. So that's it. Um, okay, so this is actually part two. <laughs> What I want to say is my thesis here is that systems actually evolve thermodynamically. That's what we mean by thermodynamics. So, so uh, one thing we know from quantum theory is that systems don't evolve mechanically. Okay, so that's the big deal with how does the you know the collapse of the wave function? How are we going to explain this? There's going to be an observer. How what does the observer do? What he does? It's absolutely impossible to explain what the observer does in terms of the the physics itself. So like. He says, well, it's arbitrary. That's one of the common things. And they, they're, they're at the point now, I say they go to the dark side. They just deny that they're observers. <laughs> Why not? So, anyway, so that, so it doesn't, so the question is, so how do systems evolve from a quantum theory point of view, which is our current understanding? The answer is we don't have a, we don't have a, there's clearly not a scientific answer to that. There's no mechanical answer to that. Okay? So, what's next? Where do we go? Uh, and so what I want to say is that uh, systems actually evolve thermodynamically. And I was just going to make a note here. The quantum theory is actually a thermodynamic theory. Uh, uh, Planck is doing his black body radiation. What was that research? It was funded by the electric light industry in Germany because they wanted to know like what kind of light I could get out per power going in. They wanted to optimize that. That was the basis of the, of the, of the research. So it was engineering research. Okay. And uh, uh, anyway, it's not a mechanical theory. It's thermodynamic. Is uh, quantum theory is a thermodynamic theory. So this is the first. <laughs> you guys all taking thermodynamics? You know, like t it, it, first, the first 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 rule of thermodynamics is don't talk about thermodynamics. So very di it's very messy, and I'm going to get into why it's messy. This is a deal. You know, so uh, Lisa had invented a uh, perpetual motion machine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Uh, so quantum theory and the system do not involve mechanically. Uh, it requires that I have some sort of, so what, what quantum theory says is, okay, I need it. Where's our worldview? Where, where are we going now? Okay. And I gave you that Einstein quote. He said, well, and, and Maxwell, we knew what it was. And, and uh, Newton, you knew it was. It's very difficult to say what it is in, in uh, quantum theory. He just says, we don't know. 
Feynman's great quote, anybody who thinks they understand quantum theory simply hasn't studied it long enough. <laughs> or just he also says, it's often quoted, nobody understands quantum theory. I would say what he's saying there is no one understands sci quantum theory in a scientific way, from a scientific point of view. I'm saying that's not too surprising because it's not understandable in a scientific or mechanical point of view. They call it quantum mechanics. But it's not. Uh, okay, so uh, now here's the deal. So, and this confused me for a few years. So this is Peter Atkins, who's probably one of the top, I mean, top thermodynamics, say who are the top thermodynamics, probably the top dozen guys in the world. So Oxford and his textbooks and everything. So he has this great book called The Second Law. And then he starts out with this, Carnot and Boltzmann epitomized thermodynamics. Carnot traveled to thermodynamics from the engine, then the symbol of industrial society. Boltzmann traveled thermodynamics from the atom, the, sim uh, the symbol of emerging scientific fundamentalism. And then he says, thermodynamics still has both aspects. And he goes on to say, they're both, they're both, both these approaches have, have manifestations. There's two different theories of thermodynamics going on. And I go like, I mean, that wasn't what I was taught. I was taught that Boltzmann was right and Carnot was some sort of, you know, afterthought or a special case within the Boltzmann thing, right? Okay. So the first thing you say is they're not compatible. One is not reducible to the other. It's long arguments for that, but... Uh, so I want to say that one... So uh, Atkins says, I think maybe they're... Just throws out, I think maybe they're complementary. I don't think that's right. I think actually the... The one is more general than the other, and I think that uh, my hypothesis is that engineering thermodynamics is actually more general than the mechanical version. Mechanical thermodynamics has so many idealizations in it, ridiculous. Uh, so, now then the next step. So, this guy Cardwell, um, he, he, he was at the University of Manchester, which was the seat of the Industrial Revolution. So, he's very interested in the engines and all this stuff. So, he started going back through the history of this stuff. And this is what he realizes. He realizes that almost traditionally, it seems, accounts of the development of the concepts of work and energy have tended to describe them within the classical framework of Newtonian mechanics. So he's saying is what when people do the history of thermodynamics, they sort of assume that mechanics is going to be the right whatever the theory of everything is going to be, it's going to be mechanics, right? So they look at it through mechanics spectacles. Okay. And so I would just suggest that this may be uh, to take too narrow a view of the case. It is to project backwards our present specialist arrangement of scientific knowledge, our present divisions between sciences, and to assume that past development was strictly guided by uh, these divisions, and this is uh, to make questionable historical and sociological assumptions. Okay, and so he goes on and says well, it's basically it's all the wrong, that in fact, if engineering thermodynamics is, as I've said, the more general one, and that's the right one, then the screw-up was... Um, the, the reason we got two is because some people went the other way. Okay, so you guys will all be, maybe, you should be familiar with this guy. Uh, he was a president of the Santa Fe Institute for a number of years. Before that, he was a particle physicist, running all the particle physics stuff at, uh, at Los Alamos. And he says, all the laws of physics can be derived from the principle of loose action. So consequently, the dynamic structure and the evolution of the universe since the Big Bang, everything from black holes, satellite transmitting, your cell phone, messages to cell phones, messages to the electrons, photons, Higgs particles, pretty much everything else is physical, are determined by such an optimizing principle. Okay. So what is the principle of least action? It's optimizing principle. So we're going to go back into the history now a little bit. So where did the principle of least action come from? This is kind of Mopartway. And arguably Leibniz had it too, and I'm, I'm more sympathetic to that right now, but anyway, I'm going with, with Mopartway. So Mopartoy comes up with this with this deal. And so there was a debate at the time called the Vis Viva debate. And it was the, the Cartesians, Descartes group said, well, what is it that's you know that's conserved in, in motion? When something moves from one place to another, something's conserved. You have to have a symmetry principle or something to make it work. It gets into geometry and everything. And they said it's MV, mass times velocity. And then and then Leibniz actually reads uh, well, some people say he got it from Galileo because Galileo sees you know, things going down. There was gravities involved here. So, so there was this debate, which one's right, which one's right. And, and there's a uh, great book by um, uh, Cardwell who says, like in England, uh, Peter Tate was like sort of the last man standing. And so he just declared that they had won. And for 100 years, that, yeah, for 100 years, that was the textbooks in English, was that, you know, that the English had won. 
So this whole thing about the relationship between Newton and Leibniz is really rich. And, uh, so anyway, Maupertuis does this funny thing. He says, he says, they're complementary. They're opposite. They don't. You can't drive one from the other. Uh, they're both right. Okay. And which one you use, if you're going one way or another, depends on your frame of reference, what your problem is. It's sort of like saying, is it particles or it's waves? Well, it's both. And if I want to look at, if I'm concerned in this situation with particle type stuff, I'm going to use this and if there's waves, I'm going to use that. And Isn't this just the distinction between momentum and energy? Um, sort of. It's more complicated than that. If you have anyway, a pulling the wagons. So, so all change. So let me just go on, guys. I can get through. All change is an action. So this is the idea of action. So this is, to me, this is the really crucial thing. He invents this idea of action. Is an action is an optimizing thing. Everything was wor everybody was working on this problem at the time. Fermat and all these guys. And then the question is, how? Do, what's the shortest distance between two points? And what they realize, if you get gravity going on, then actually the shortest time. Okay, the shortest time is actually this other curve, which turns out to be a cycloid. Uh, and uh, so this is called the brachis to chrome problem. And uh, this is where, where well, Patrice says, oh, you know, there's an optimization going on here. And, uh, and the, the, the example that, that uh, Maupertuis uses in, in, uh, in uh, Euler likes a lot is, is, is an orbit, an orbit of a planet. So the, the planets are orbiting, okay? So you've got two, two different things going on. You've got the, you know, like if gravity disappears, it's just going to shoot off into space, right? Then you've got gravity pulling it in. So these are two things, and they're optimized. In order to have a regular orbit keep going, those have to stay, they have to be balanced in a certain way. They have to be optimized, okay? If the gravity increases, there's going to be a problem. If the speed of the planet increases, there's a problem. So, uh, Maupertuis, uh, I take this is my extreme version of Maupertuis, says everything in the universe is kind of like those, those orbits. Everything in the universe is an optimization of, of complementary uh, types of force and, and motion. Okay. And, uh, and he goes on, this is where some people part ways with Maupertuis. But, and he said, so, but I'm trying to get it to you here. So, optimization, so in order for for optimization to make sense, in my mind anyway, you have to have two things that are sort of incommensurable or incompatible. Okay, if you don't have two things, you just calculate it out. I mean, it's just one thing, and you just calculate it out. If you got two opposite things, two opposite complementary aspects to reality, then you have to optimize. So he's saying essentially everything in the universe is optimized. Now, then he says, so we look at engineering thing. What do engineers do? What do engineers do? They optimize. They're looking for the solution to something. They're looking for an optimum. Okay, they got multiple factors, and they're looking for an optimum. So what Maupertuis says is that all these optimums in the universe, the structure of the universe, all these optimum things that are in the universe as, it, as we see it, have some tibios to them. In other words, they have some sense of being a solution, of something that was accomplished. Okay. All right. So that's the values thing coming in again. All right, so uh, now two things happened from Maupertuis. Uh, so Euler, who's like the mathematician's mathematician, he has like 2,000 articles, everybody's the greatest thing in sliced bread. So Euler, Euler says, Maupertuis, no, so Maupertuis, you're, you're correct, of course, but it's not very useful. Now, it's taken me like a bloody year to figure out what, he's, what the hell he's talking about here. And this whole has to do with if you think of quantum theory and says like, oh, it's you know the universe is going with both these things all the time, right? And you say, well, that's not that's great. You know, there's always a particle aspect and wave aspect. That's not very useful. If I'm trying to do my experiment. Okay, so the usefulness thing is coming down and and uh, and I have to dampen one out or find the equilibrium state of one in order to investigate the other, to find nice Cartesian relationships. So. It's a little bit. Anyway, so Lagrange picks up on this, and uh, and there's an optimization in Lagrange, and, and um, that goes on. So you get this. So I'm going to say there's. I'm going to tell you about this. Car Carnot goes this way from Maupertuis, and Lagrange goes this way. Where Lagrange goes is that he always ends up with conservation of energy, and he always ends up with a symmetry. Uh, Carnot doesn't. Carnot sees something else, which I'm going to. Okay, so uh, Lazar Carnot, you probably never heard of him? Terry? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so we can do that. Okay, I'll get, I'll get we, as far we as can, I can. We can stick around any questions a little longer. But if you could wrap up. I will, I mean, if, if, I will if, if there's a way to come to a close. Yes, that would be good. To okay, so. All right, so uh, Lazar, this is my current project. I'm translating Lazar. So it turns out that Saudi Carno, everybody's heard of Saudi Carno, was his father, Lazar, and Lazar was writing stuff like about this uh, uh, 15 years before Saudi was even born. Saudi, the argument is that Saudi's. Uh, uh, a famous treatise on uh, uh, power of fire is actually just an application of Lazar's thing. So, so Lazar is a genius, and, uh, and uh, these are the things we're translating right now. So, uh, these are some of the Lazar's colleagues at the they're all at Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. It's, an, it's renowned as the first engineering university, and uh, it was military engineering, but they're all engineers. They're doing all this stuff. You got Lagrange there. You got Fourier. You got Coriolis. You got Cauchy. They're all his colleagues. Okay. All right. So, uh, so what, <clears throat> what happens is there's two ideas of action. One was this track I'm seeing with Carnot, and the other one was Lagrange. Lagrange goes into mechanics, which goes into Hamiltonian mechanics and all. But they are really mechanics because they they insist on conservation. They can't handle dissipation too well. So there's problems with them, but there So this, so uh, Lazar goes in and explains the whole thing, which I'm not going to go into. So um, anyway, this is it's just going to be too deep. Want to go on? So, so what happened then is uh, the, the Gorgian thing has dominated. You go Lagrange and Hamilton is the way we do physics. But this other, this other idea of action, Maupertuis's idea of action, that has incorporates this dual this complementary aspects, comes up again. Where does it come up? It comes up in, uh, in uh, quantum theory. And Planck, uh, in here, uh, no. well, Planck, Planck basically realizes that his concept of action, quantum action, is the same as Maupertuis. It's a big article that Planck writes about his connection to Maupertuis. And one commentator says that Maupertuis was, was uh, Planck's bedside reading. But only we got this other idea of action. And this idea of action, uh, which is the principle of the least action of work, uh, is basically, I would say, it's the rebirth of the engineering point of view, which comes from Montre, you know. So, um, and it's not surprising, if I'm right here, that Maupertuis, after he writes his things about this thing, goes on and writes two, two major, his two major works are on evolution. Evolution of the cosmos, and then that Earth is a source of things. Uh, and say optimization. That's what I said before. Just optimization is unique to engineering. Optimization technically doesn't happen in science. It's just you calculate the answer, right? Okay. Um, what Dewey ends up saying is that engineering evolution is the construction of the good. Your values thing. So uh, ja this is a great book. I saw it. it was fabulous book. Uh, optimization principles lie at the heart of everything. Da -da 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 -da. Okay. So this is LeBron, LeBron, Man Hamilton. It's a great book called The Lazy Universe. A good introduction to the principle of least action. Uh, Jennifer, I was telling her that she asks all these wonderfully heretical questions, but then she goes to the dark side in the end. <laughs> Anyway, so there's there's one line that goes to uh, you know Lagrange and Hamilton, the other line goes to uh, Carnot and Planck. Um, okay, this is pretty much it. I'm not going to go through these. So um, so I'm kind of I've, I've sort of already done this. So I I told you what I was going to tell you, and I told you what I was going to tell you. So real quick, I'm going to just go through. So we, we talked about the implications for understanding economics from an engineering point of view. Massively important new growth economics. Uh, and Tam Althusian, there's a more part of this. I want you to understand with this. It's in my interest of this succeed. First time I saw it, I like sounds a lot like the it's a practical version of the Golden Rule or something like that. And I was like, but New Growth Economics also has a thing that says, you know, the the way in which you were all of the same system. So there's an idea of the politics, this complementarity of politics, and it has a moral thing in it too. Okay, so we got through all that. And went through this, and went through that, and that's and Bill Martin and all these guys. So anyway, so that's it. Boop, boop. So are there are not any questions because it's just absolutely clear. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
All right. Any questions? Well, Stephen Weinberg would be the devil's advocate because, you know, his um, looking at the laws of physics and the laws of physics that in engin engineering comes from the laws of physics. One of the best guys in the in the cosmology right now is, is Lee Smolin. And Smolin is, because I don't want to try to tell you that there, there's no time. Time doesn't pass in the Newtonian point world and it doesn't pass in the Maxwellian extreme either. It's all, time's already done. And so, if the real world is a combination of these two, then you get some different deal. And Lee Smolin has one called Time Reborn. and There's a bunch of guys on this. Interesting, anyway, it's, it's, they're struggling, but then they want, is there a meta, you know, so they, they want the laws to change over time. They want the laws to evolve as a structure of the universe evolves. And uh, they're kind of there, but they don't go that far. Um, Smolin's partner, Unger, um, um, definitely goes into pragmatism and sees it is evolving. Uh, the pragmatist, one of the pragmatists, Charles Sanders Pierce, said that what we call the laws of the universe are simply the habits, the acquired habits of the universe. It's like, oh, we're going to do it this way, and we're going to do it another way. We'll do, develop the habits. We develop as we develop our habits. We get mature. We get older. We get we do it better. Different designs. Anyway, so questions? Oh, yes. Yeah. So it's going back to kind of your first half of the presentation, where you're yeah. trying to establish, I think, that the overarching theory of how everything works should be more of an engineering mindset yes. than a science one. Yes. But then, when somebody over here asks the question about if you're actually doing an action, building something, and you have more knowledge, wouldn't it take scientific, a scientific approach to understand why that person then has more knowledge? So couldn't, you know, no. you argue that this is it's Vincenti's. still within a different framework? Well, this is, this is subtle. I mean, he's a, kind of a counterexample. So Bert Rutan, you know, he is he did a Spaceship One, for this, uh, also an aeronautical engineer, and I'm going like, hey, Bert, you know, you have a moment. I said, Bert, let's do it. And I said, so you're, in, you're the engineering inside, and you, how, what's your engineering method? He said, no, sir, it's all science. I'm like, no, Bert. <laughs> so... What Vincenti is saying is, so science is a tool, science, these nice Cartesian relationships that occur within boundary conditions, okay, are great. But, I mean, I'll, I'll design something and it, and it doesn't work. And I go like, you know, I think if we, it doesn't work because of temperature question. So let's, let's reduce the temperature on it. And, oh, now it works. Okay. So the point is you're not going to derive the, how this thing works from the science. Okay. Once you have, using the science as a tool, you can, you know, it's a great tool. They're great tools. But it's not, it's not, engineering knowledge is, di is something more than, than scientific knowledge. And then I try to make these other cases more generally that, that um, scientific knowledge just doesn't make any sense anyway. Because there's no, what's inquiry in science? So whatever it is science, what we call science is doing, it's very, very interesting. This, I, I mentioned this, uh, which I'd recommend to you, this, Thing that uh, the Carnot wrote. If you want to understand this, let me get to it here. He wrote this. Uh, this. It's translated about infinitesimal analysis. So, what do we do with infinitesimal analysis? So, so there's a lot of these guys are lines and uh, lines and curves. Okay, are these the same? Okay. Arguably, I mean, this is like. People trying to, you know, like I get a polyhedron inside of a circle, trying to find the area of the circle, and I just make, I got the infinite number. Why was it use infinity, infinities to get to the, to get to the, to get from lines to, to, to uh, circles? And another thing you do is say, well, what a curve is, if I have an infinitesimal straight line, and I make up, and I apply this to my curve, and then I integrate over that, then I have actually, I've reduced the curve to a, 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 a series of straight lines. There are cases where that's useful. <laughs> it's just like, why is this useful? But the use of infinitesimal analysis to do that. Now, what Carnot is saying essentially is, he starts out and saying, oh, the whole idea of an infinitesimal is just stupid. I mean, come on, I used to be upset in thermodynamics, like, oh, the piston is moving infinitely slowly. What? Is it moving or is it not moving? No, it's moving infinitely slowly. What does that mean? And what it's doing is dampening out this thing. I say, I want it to move, but I don't want work to be occurring, okay? So I just pretend like work's not occurring. But it's pretending, I'm idealizing. So you use infinitesimal analysis to make these idealizations. And that's, 
how science works. So when I'm doing science, what I'm looking for is a situation where it's bounded and I can repeat it. Okay, so scientists are looking for that. Poincaré, who's you know famous guy, talked about science as conventionalism. Kant talks about these being um, these methods being uh, regulatory heuristics. They're not you know the world isn't like that. The world is you can find these things and they're not hard, they're not easy to find. Find these relationships, which we call scientific relationships, but they just are tools. And once you find them, it's a great tool. You know, if I do pressure and temperature this way, it kind of works. But those tools don't. Um, tell you how to do anything. Okay, they're just they're elements, and so the real context is always going to be engineering. And what we're doing, we're we're engineers. One thing I call Carnot's epiphany. This is a, which kind of comes up is Carnot's epiphany is we're engineers in a world of engineering. Everything is engineering. Everything's doing engineering. We're all doing engineering. Everything's engineering. So yeah. does that include the, the future of science itself? For example, the quest for, say, quantum gravity or something like that. Is that a scientific pursuit, or do you consider that something that would have to be unfolded in your new paradigm? Well, this is subtle, because the war that goes on, all the way back to, to Carnot and back, they, they distinguish between rational mechanics and empirical mechanics. Okay? The rational mechanics goes, is going for this model that everything's axiomatizable. Okay, the organization and all knowledge be axiomatizable. So if I approach your question about the relationship between us from that point of view, is I'm looking for some way to getting those together axiomatized, I can derive everything from it, then you would see it as a scientific question or as a logical or a mathematical question. From the point of view of uh, engineering, it would be what, what's, the practical, what's the practical question? You know, where, how does it come up in a practical context and how does it come up? So I'd say that, I mean, what I'm going to say is that, what sense, to get a sense of the relationship between science and engineering, to say there is no science. Okay, everything that we've understood as science, we understand it as, as this logical, mathematical uh, deal. It isn't. There, there's no such thing. Now, well, there is. Of course, there is. I mean, we have this thing called double negative statements. It's not that there aren't. It's not that there aren't any particles. It's not that there aren't any waves. It's just that they aren't universal. Okay, it's not that there isn't a Newtonian mechanics that works really, really well. <coughs> And there isn't a Maxwellian you know, electromagnetist law that works really, really well. But just neither one of them are universal. Okay, so oh, this is so. Is it science? Is is, is uh, it science? Yeah, but it, when it's science, but it's also incomplete, inherently incomplete. All, everything you would know is science. Every scientific theory is inherently incomplete, and it's always bounded. Uh, Herb Simon always talks about bounded rationalities. Within that realm, you can also use induction. Induction works. That's good. Because there's a uniformity in there, okay. But you step slightly outside of it, to raise the temperature, or do something. Yeah, go ahead. One more question. So it seems like changing this whole view to more of an engineering perspective yes. is increasing complexity versus a scientific perspective. And so I think maybe there would be people who argue that it'd be more advantageous to fully understand things to reduce the complexity. And so like that mathematical understanding is the most basic way of understanding. Well, this is like, why does somebody say this is the this is the kiss of death of the scientific community? That is just exactly what you said. Because like, why are we doing it? Why would you be doing that? Why do you want to understand the world? Do you imagine that you're going to be able to do things? No. Nah. And this goes back to, and, and said way, way back, you know, like, well, what are the scientists are going to find these universal laws governing everything and everything's deterministic? Do they imagine that they're going to have any practical benefit of that? Simple. <laughs> it's a simple way to look at the world. But it doesn't, first of all, it doesn't work, okay, because you can show. The question is, I mean, I wrote a bunch of Karl Popper's thing on is it, is it refutable, okay? Is it falsifiable? And that's what you have to start asking. It turns out that these these opposite, you know, like the, the complementary things. If you want to know what's wrong with this way of looking at the world, you have to find its complement. Okay, and if you can demonstrate its complement, you can you're demonstrating its limits. And they all, everything's complementary. Everything's optimized, as Jeff West is saying, for these complementarities. So the idea that there is, yeah, they've all been going for oh, it's elegant, you know, this elegant solution is a. There's a huge amount of bullshit in that, and. Uh, and there's this ongoing war between people who want, who think they can understand the world totally in terms of one axiomatized mathematical whatever. I and mean, this is sort of get, got kicked around with Gödel's theorem, like, no, sorry, there is no such 
possible mathematics. It's not going to happen. And uh, but they just got to go fly on as if whatever. So and I'm not saying that they shouldn't do that. Uh, my friend, um, uh, mathematician, we talked about this, and we, he said, "Well, where where do the good ideas come? Where have the best ideas come from in mathematics um, over the last hundred years or something like that? They all came from outside. Okay, they weren't like some deductive thing. Let's work out this problem. No, they had turbulence and stuff like that. These were these were ideas coming from phenomena that we discovered and encountered that then mathematics is trying to play, is playing catch up." And the argument is basically that science is all, science we call science is always making is playing catch up with engineering. Okay, there's a whole thing in history of science and engineering, or which came first, science or engineering? And there's a very strong argument that all the advances in science come from engineering advances, telescopes, and things like that. Anyway, any other question? Yeah, go. Well, I feel that so many questions. Questions. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, they can go. Here we go. <laughs> but we're taking names. <laughs> I, I propose that we structure our questions to get progressively more theoretical, and then I'll start with something very practical. And then, because <laughs> uh, I, I want to ask you also about sure. the mathematics. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to stick to just a, okay. something that I feel is pretty simply described. The behavior reaction. So I, I completely agree with you. I think you know that's why a lot of us are here. My dissertation is, is really looking at how we design, I'm an architect, so I'm looking at you know, mm -hmm. what is the, and I don't, I don't really hear you getting into the different ways that someone may go about engineering or designing or being creative. Yeah, yeah. And I would, I would venture that, you know, they're, they're quite different. And those yeah, that involve different from, scientific different from theory. Are they different amongst, okay, you're saying that, well, sorry, you're saying they're, that, they're, that a lot of people have different ways of approaching? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, this yeah. thing, just like the Wright brothers, um, sure. Designing the first yeah. airplane. Yeah. They they begin with kites, right? They know yeah. nothing about Bernoulli's principle. They're just using like flat boards. But at some point, they realize that if, you know if they have a, a, a dual surface wing, then they can get you know this mm -hmm. Bernoulli mm -hmm. potential mm -hmm. that, that they would not have um, fully understood if they didn't have the grounding and, and the, the scientific. Principle. Now let me just ask you real quick: Were, were their experiments engineering research or science? I well, think I'd say making a false well, thing. I, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to play into that binary distinction because I, I think that's where you're kind of. Going well, to I'm saying there is no distinction. Yeah. Right, but I'm saying there's two. Okay, let's say there's two different ways of, of engineering something. All right. You can do the kind of the blind, like I'm just going to throw things together and see what works. Like Oppenheimer, we're going to smash this atom until it makes a big bang. Yeah. And we don't really have to know anything about quantum mechanics to do that. We just yeah. need the, the facilities to try and hammer this thing until it explodes. Hammer it right? this way, hammer it that way. Whereas if you come at it from a, a, a say quantum, quantum mechanics perspective, you may be able to, you know, say, well, if we use plutonium, it's going, it's probably going to be much more unstable and likely to explode, so let's do that. So you can, you can find a shortcut. Whereas it could take much longer if you're just kind of randomly you know, and, and this gets maybe back well, to let me, the, let, me, let me respond to that a little bit. So I would say to you this, and you tell me if I'm wrong, that there's no technology at all derivable from quantum theory. What's that got to do with the price of butter? The question is, what he's saying, the question is whether or not, I thought where he was driving here was to say, I, if I have quantum theory, then I can design these things. No, no I'm saying here the two together. If, 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 you're, if you're trying to design something, yeah. and you have some some theoretical knowledge about, sure. about yeah. that realm, it yeah. be much Absolutely. more effective Absolutely. than if you're just kind of blindly going into it. Well, so of course, that's what they're, they're saying. Know. I mean, they got, they, 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 yeah. all these tools are great, but the right. tools themselves don't tell you how to build something. Right. right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's okay. different ways of building. He wants to be well, up on me. Let's go. see if we can wed these theories, okay? I'm gonna totally willing to grant you that all science, as you're calling it, came from the world. Great, it's a distillation of trial and effect down to the nugget of theory. And then when you stand briefly, as a high school math teacher, my example of this is you ask them the three, three equations and three unknowns, and they learn to do it as equations, and then they learn to do it as a matrix. And what you've done is you've taken the word problem, and you've left, and you've gone into the world of abstractions where you can do an inverse matrix and walk back to the world. So the distillation from the world of trial and error and the emergence of theory ends with a hyper abstract not in the world thing and as they say in theory there's no difference between theory and practice 
and in practice there is. So returning from the world of theory into any baby implementation breaks immediately and starts a whole new round with that brand new theory to change it. And so I hear you saying that science is this, you know, the the, the movie version of the scientist who doesn't know how dangerous their science is and they just want to find out absent the motivational envelope of why'd you want to know and what do you do with it after. I get that you're calling the bigger envelope engineering and everyone here is cringing because we're like, it's also metaphysics. <laughs> it is metaphysics. It is, and so, you know... I, I, the, well, it depends on what you mean by metaphysics. But, yeah. You know, the, the theories of, of how things come to exist, including action research and including value systems and including the agents yeah, yeah. who gave a crap in the this first place. This is what is all about. You know, so I, I agree it's the... It's the notion that, and like for years, hundreds of years, new fields and old fields are like, you know what? We're the everything field. Yeah. You know, yeah. Biology will be mechanics, or mm -hmm. psychiatry will solve it all. And then it's right now, system science is let me give an example, yeah. with engineering for to be the everything field. Yeah, let me give you think a, that we yeah. are. <laughs> well, but the thing, well, that's why I like my self-referential coherence, because that's pretty dramatic. I mean, I think that that Royce's argument that that whatever theory you come up with has to be self-referentially coherent it needs to be able to make sense of itself. Yeah. That's a very tough requirement. It, it makes perfect and, sense. And it, doesn't, it does not apply to science, number one. And I also say, uh, I didn't go into this, but Royce's uh, criterion of self-referential coherence is also very, very, this is a very, very neat approach to self-reference paradoxes in general going all the way back to, you know, Russell and Whitehead and the whole thing. All the, I would argue, I think, I'm going to say all, but a large number of what we've called self-reference paradoxes resolve. I, mean, I was talking to a guy about sure. I would say, I say this, they don't come up yeah. in engineering. You zoom out and it ain't there. Okay. But they come up when you try and formulate this stuff in terms of science or in terms of mathematics, you get self-reference paradoxes. Now when I hear you say science, what I'm hearing is William Wool's 1885 hypothetical deductive method that worked really well for chemistry. You could poke it and then do a hypothesis and a new experiment, but the word scientific method has been taken into social sciences, it's been taken yeah. into neuroscience, it's been taken in so far away from that hypothetical deductive reductive testable method. Yeah. That it is, it, it is a stale word. Well, it doesn't really, the hypothetical deductive method, now. I mean, that's where it came from in the philosophy of science. And then basically, the hypothetical deductive model just doesn't work. But as a, as a high school math, it doesn't, well, it doesn't work, it could be good too. It doesn't, it doesn't allow you to reconstruct how things actually happened. And there were a lot of what we called rational reconstructions. I had a guy in a seminar of mine, he's going to solve. This is how it worked, and I go like, well, where do you, have, do you ever look at the? Have you looked at the historical, you know, details of this? Is that is that actually how it worked? Is that I don't need to look at the historical details. It had to happen this way because because okay. my model's real good. Yeah, yeah. And that's my my fire Robin, who was my, one of my mentors, and he used to say that I, 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 I was I come up with this great idea, and I go, hey, here's this great idea about how science works. And he goes like, so have you looked at the history implied by this? I said, well, no. Well, go look at the history, and inevitably, when you go look at the history, you're like, oh, actually, yeah, it wasn't quite that like simple. How chemistry, the, the actual hypothesized chemical equation, never matches well, at all. Yeah, there's a guy. Because well, of the uneven distribution of the atoms. Roald Hoffman, you know Roald Hoffman. So Roald Hoffman got a chemistry Nobel Prize. He's at Cornell, I think. So yeah, everybody will call the same and not the same. And he, he wrote a great article. You can look it up in. Uh, called American Scientist. This is a Sigma Xi publication. And, and basically what he said is that real science, real, account, real history science, is always narrative. Okay, it's a story. The guy tells you, like, here's how I came up with it, here's what I did, and I was going this way and I go that way. I'm not saying it's the only way to get there, but it's not, there was no hypothetical deductive method. There was no logical scientific method. Fire up and my, my mentor wrote a book called uh, uh, Against Method, where basically he says, you know, show me the method. You think there's a scientific method? Show me. And it's, it's not there. No one's no one's come up with it. Pretty and sure people, it's design theory, just like your type. Well, is okay, it. but design. But remember my existential designer. My existential designer is I have the ability to do stuff in the world. I don't have a script. Okay, I don't. Here's a script on how to innovate. 
and not exist, doesn't exist. Not to say you can't be sensitive to innovation, to encourage innovation, you do all sorts of stuff. But when someone comes up with something new, really new, it's a qualitative step, it's not a logical step. It's like I've jumped to a new way of looking at the world, a new way of thinking about things. Just remember that jump isn't embedded in an algorithm. No, it's not. There's a there's a guy. It's um, designed. Not paying at all. Anyway, he just wrote a bunch of stuff on stuff. twenty Make famous plans. twenty twenty papers by f people who got the Nobel Prize later, and these papers were rejected by all sorts of journals. Why? Because they're understanding the situation in a new way, in a qualitatively new way. I see guys come back and they say, "You just don't understand thermodynamics. Go back to go back to school, and you you know, you're not you're thinking." You don't understand entropy, and I'm like, no, I understand what you think entropy is. I think I'm understanding a new way. Well, this is beyond. There. Okay, Marty, kill me. Uh, two points. <laughs> okay. uh, one is, uh, I think you're, you're. See, I would say uh, science is a fusion. Have I convinced you you're an engineer? No. No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, but en I, engineering is valuable. It's very important. All right. All right. I, I certainly agree with that. I thought in Corvallis but, you were yeah, going with that. No, science is a fusion the empirical and the rational. And you're claiming, yeah. you're taking the empirical component of science, and you're saying that's engineering. Well, if you want to define it that way, that's what you're doing. But but no one would ever say that science doesn't have a very substantial empirical component. People do things. People try things out. It's not it's not necessarily rational. So, so I think it's unfair. But I would just want to but say that that's engineering. Well, OK, so I disagree. I, I think it's. In, inappropriate to say that anything that the empirical aspect of science is itself engineering. That I think is a misuse of language. Point number I disagree. Two. Okay, you disagree. Okay. Point number two, a very Across interesting uh, set of volumes uh, by Joseph Needham huh? on science and civilization in China. Yeah. And Needham is motivated by the question of why did science develop in the West and not in China, which was technologically far more advanced than the West. And so science doesn't develop uh, bottom-up simply by the gradual growth of technology. No, you need a, a totally different take on things. And you know, maybe you even need the notion that that you know God created the world with you know with, with you know divine order which motivated many of the pioneers of the scientific no revolution. They were all, they were most of them, maybe all of them, religious people. Yep. And they were interested not in solving practical problems, even though they used data that came from practical problems, but they were interested in uncovering, uh, you know, God's plan. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when, and they were interested in beauty. And when Kepler discovered ellipses, instead of circles, yeah. you know how he, how he characterized his ellipses. He said, he sort of imagined himself with this cart of dung. You know, ellipses were ugly, smelly, <laughs> as compared to the beauty of circles. So, yes. so this is not engineering. This is, this is motivation that comes from a different source. Yeah. And it's, it's the deep motivation to understand, to know what's true, independent of what's good. Yeah. And so, well, I don't think that's true, but it's, uh, <laughs> but it's so. And the, the thing okay. is, well, no, maybe they're trying to do that. They, they think that that's, that's what they're trying to do. I'm just saying it's not what they're doing. My, uh, well, uh, I want to say Drago, my colleague Drago is, yeah, it's always nice to find somebody who agrees with you, so he, he and I are on this. Uh, uh, Terry, are you saying Gödel's theorem? Um, applies to science and drags it down as compare it doesn't apply to engineering and engineering works in infinitesimals? Uh, I don't buy the last part you said, but the, so does, so the image that like that Marty's talking about is that, that uh, you know, this guy wrote the uh, amazing, why is mathematics so amazing and understanding yeah. reality? Okay. So, yeah, well, it turns out is, is you know, it is, it is, it is as long as you idealize and as long as you don't worry about that. And it is something that needs to be addressed. And this is what I'm trying to tell you. The really subtle thing in all this is that there are 
two different tracks of science, okay? The one, for instance, having to do with waves, one having to do with particles. In every si area of science that you go into, there are always these dualities. And, and, uh, and he tries to point out why that's the case and why it's okay to do that. Okay, one is that what, what he does in this is he, he, he explains the justification for using the calculus. I don't know if it bothered you. I mean, a friend of mine and I used to talk, why are we assuming that all the functions are continuous? Why would you assume that all the functions are continuous? There's all there's evidence that that's not the case, but why do we do that? It's a, all models are bad and some are better than others. Yeah, well, it's a regulative, it's a regulatory principle. It's a, it's a principle of, of uh, Kant called it a heuristic principle. Now, there's, that's what I'm looking for. I, I don't care if it, but, you know, the big world maybe has this, you know, this other structure, this metaphysical structure, but that that's, doesn't help me if I want to build a, something or other. So what I want is, is something that's going to have these, what I see these nice Cartesian relationships, okay, so I can tell this and this, I'm going to be able to do that, I can see the function is continuous, but every time I find one of those, it's always within boundary conditions. And, and I like I like Gibbs and Helmholtz uh, free energy concepts. They're they're really capturing the synthesis of, the, of these things. So you got you got highly constrained situations, and within those highly constrained situations, I have a lot of flexibility that I can act. So so in order for me to walk, if somebody said, if I'm on the outer space, it's really hard for me to move around. Okay, I'm just okay. So having the gravity and the ground, this is a great constraint. So I can't I can't go down under the ground. But that ground is a constraint that allows me to walk. Okay, so there's always this marriage of constraints and, and enablings. Constraints are not, oh, so you can't do this and you can't do that. Well, that's true, but they're also enabling. Okay, the constraints enable me to do, to do stuff. Okay, that's a model of how you get the engineering of the science together. The other thing I'd say, Marty, which is really subtle, I'd say with the math too, is this, what, ha what was happening in science was like, Oh, we had number theory, okay? And, and, and number, we had a great number theory, and it's very wonderful, it's great. And then we found, for instance, square root of two, you know. <laughs> Pythagoreans find that. They weren't really happy about that. Yeah, and then they said, well, we, okay, well, we're going to revise our idea of numbers. So now we have, you know, we have yeah, regular numbers and we have irrational numbers. And then it goes on for a little bit, and then we got to go, okay, what about, what about, what about the square root of minus one? Well, that's in there too, but we didn't add, you know, so what we were doing was, the, the idea of a number was actually developing, okay, the idea of E and, and all these other things. So the number, idea of number, an idea of force, the idea of a particle, all these things develop over time. And, and they, uh, and so they, uh, um, so but each time you take a step, then you axiomatize it, okay? So it looks like you're going from axiomatized system to axiomatized system to axiomatized system. So obviously the final outcome is going to be axiomatizable, right? And then, oops, no, it's impossible to axiomatize the total system. Quantum theory, Gödel's theorem, so we can't do that. So what have we been doing? So what Kuhn says we've been doing is each one of these steps to this axiomatized system, this axiomatized system, this axiomatized system, these are paradigm shifts. Okay, and they're different concepts. These are qualitative changes. That's why science is not a logical deductive thing. It, it, you explore, you find something new, you revise. Oh, okay. I mean, that's well, so I totally agree with that. But then Adam Nunes wrote a book. About very, that, thank you. Okay, Marty, thanks. Yeah. So, do you want? Do you personally feel like there isn't something um, in mathematics that does seem to lend itself to this idea that mathematics is this kind of uh, potential realm of? of theory that, that uh, has its own unique ordering methodology. Um, I mean, you, there's something unique going on in mathematics. So, well, it's a subtle question. Okay, it's a subtle question. Math without a word problem as a word. Well, it, yeah. Well, no, you, you can't. You can, the, the, this, this idea would be that you could just go in a box with with the history of mathematics and come out. You know, you could take in Lorenz's transformation and come out with relativity. Because relativity comes right out of the mathematics. Yeah. Uh, Einstein was working on, you know, Einstein was coming at it from a mathematical um, concept. How yeah. do you can remove people from the culture? Well, that's true, but I mean, just to try and answer your question, it's, it's a really good question, and uh, there's a lot of people, was it Tegmark just wrote this thing, you know, the mathematical universe and all these guys, and I think, you know, uh, I, I Sean Carroll wrote this book called The Big Picture, which is the same sort of stuff, reducing it all to some sort of potential field that we can't really specify because it's all these, uh, all these uh, phony experiments. And, and I, wrote, I was writing a deal and I said, you know, this is the best of books and the worst of books. 
Okay, so the idea that you can do that, that you can find some ultimate rational, you know, uh, mathematics, and there's a bunch of stuff just recently about guys in mathematics that are doing the proving Fermat's theorem and all this sort of stuff. And, and you look at that stuff, you know, <laughs> What is it they're doing? What is it they think they're doing? And and there's a lot of I, I, one of my other mentors, a guy named Emery Lakatos, sort of called proofs and refutations. And what he said is, is all proofs, okay, all proofs are fallible. Okay, so any proof, any ma all mathematical proofs are fallible. And he goes through. He uses actually Euler's thing about vertices, edges, and you know, so he goes through that, and, he, and you see, and I say, oh, well, this one looks, you know, embedded. I mean, what about a cube embedded in a cube? Oop, that one doesn't work. So he says, well, it's a monster. It doesn't count. <laughs> it's not really a You know, so all these things that go on, and you see the same thing happening in science. You see the same thing happening in mathematics. But trying to make one overall general thing, I'd say that there's not one mathematics any more than there's one science. Now, taking quantum theory into mathematics is really, really weird. And very interesting, and it comes out with you know you get complementary mathematics. The mathematics of Newtonian science and the mathematics of Maxwellian science are not compatible. They're just different. They're just different things, and they have different stuff. <laughs> they have, one has waves that do these things, and one has particles that do these things. And you try and say, well, the math of one math they're not the same, and one is not reducible to the other. So. Quantum theory is saying essentially that you want to say that the universe, you know, mathematics is really, really cool and is useful and is wonderful, but one mathematics, no. There's a lot. I just reading uh, Bertrand Russell. I get it. Bertrand Russell has a great thing on the, the metaphysical foundations of geometry or something like that. It's really good. Actually, the one thing I was going to tell you guys about, which I've been struggling with for about I don't know, ten years, I finally figured it out, and, and and it comes out of it comes out of Leibniz actually. And it's about thermodynamics. It's why. So, so Gaia, okay, the Earth. This system has been in thermal disequilibrium for at least three and a half billion years. I mean, that should not be happening. I mean, it's not yet a cold hard rock. I mean, not cold hard rock. And you know, like, what? What the hell's going on? Well, you can kind of see it. It's life, obviously. But you got the O2 producers yeah. and the CO2 producers, yeah. and they're going back and forth, and they they form yeah. a consortium and stuff like that. And this is uh, it's a version of what they used to call in uh, uh, Darwin's day, so the, um, what is it volcanoes up and rain down? What they call it uh, steady state theories. Okay. So wait a minute. So guy is steady state, homostatic. That's what these guys. That's what Lovelock said. It looks like a homostatic system. Now the problem is that it evolves. So you got this thing, this is static, it's an equilibrium, but it evolves. Or the question is, on the question is, how do you get those two together? Now, if you read, if you ever get around to reading mm -hmm. Aristotle's Metaphysics, there's seven essays all addressing the same question: How can you have being and becoming at the same time? Mm -hmm. Okay, he, uh, I say he beats the question to death. He approaches it from seven different angles, approaches, perspectives, assumptions. And it always comes up with, I don't know, it doesn't work. And uh, I just figured it out. <laughs> I can't tell you. It's probably, it has to do with the environment. The environment no, is well, it goes all the way down to the geometry. And I mean, what, what Leibniz, so I'll tell you what it is, I'll just tell you real quick. So what Leibniz says is, everything in the world is created, okay? Now, you know, computers are created. What about particles? Okay, well, go back to read Steve Weinberg's first three minutes. And you have these symmetry-breaking events. Symmetry breaking, symmetry. Okay, if your basic assumption is that your framework of explanation is symmetry, you have no possible explanation of these things. So particles are created, okay, these are creative acts. I don't say that God did it, or I don't give a what you want to say. But these are created things, and they're getting increasing, they have, uh, they have thermal potential. Stars form. Well, not stars are not supposed to form in entropy going. Poof. So stars are forming, and it's interesting that they're like, out of a million degrees corona or something like that, and two degrees outer space, it's a huge gradient. Right, right. Which is exactly what you want to be able to perform work. So the universe seems to be going the wrong direction. And then when you have a supernova, they create 15 minutes when the thing collapses, they create, you know, like in the first stage, all the elements up to iron. And they spew them out into space. Now, why don't those things just fall apart? They were created in high pressure and high temperature. When the temperature and pressure is gone and they're out in space, why don't they fall apart? Right. Well, how do they go through a phase change that encodes them for the future? 
Yeah. So they're, I mean, these have thermal potential. Okay, and everything that has thermal potential, everything that has a temperature, okay, has thermal potential. And so again, that's the interesting part about dark matter, it doesn't have a temperature. <laughs> problem there. But the point is, all these things, I mean, you go up through, I can go up, start back in the cosmology, and then you go all the way up, and then you get up to like the Earth. And then you see that the, you know, the, the evolution is doing the same thing. This is what Bill Martin and those guys are saying. They tell me, they say, look, it looks to me like it's inevitable. You know, the life is just, it's just doing it, okay? Now it has to search and has to do all this sort of, you know, it's like it doesn't have a script, but it finds its way, okay? Uh, if you read uh, Vincenti's book, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there about astrobiology. It says, if, you, if we find a planet, that's about the size of the Earth, has roughly our atmosphere, da da da, all this sort of thing. He said, if they have things that fly that have exoskeletons, like a, you know, like a, whatever, you know, beetles or, I don't know, what, I'm thinking of uh, locusts or something like that. They have exoskeletons and stuff like that. He said, I'll tell you how large they can be. Yeah, sure. Because the, the large is their, meta, their meta metabolism, the possible metabolism, that's their, that's their driver. And I can tell you how much lift they're going to get. Regardless of whatever, you know, so, you know, so yeah. I'll tell you how big they can be. That's Jeffrey West's thing, too. Yeah. Scale. Scale. Yeah. yeah. Got it. And you know, um, uh, Schrodinger's Life, a little book on the world called Life. Yeah, or What is Life? Yeah. Nature, what is Life? Yeah. yeah. He talks about light, you know, we, we are. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Tracking your. <laughs> already? You're leaving already? <laughs> Theoretical hell. <laughs> He makes a great argument that um, we're neg entropy machines. We create more entropy, even though we're organized. We, and stars are probably neg entropy. So it, it still holds true with the second law of thermodynamics. Well, entropy is a very, very difficult concept. And, and the whole thing of what Carnot did is, or uh, what Clausius did to Carnot is very interesting. But Just because uh, you're skiing downhill doesn't mean you're not still going downhill. Real lateral, real lateral. I have, go up a right. I have a group of guys. Down, right. I have a group of guys I deal with. I call them the entropy cult, and they all they think the whole universe is running down. I think see, I'm saying the universe is running up. And, uh, and uh, it's because uh, uh, engineering action is net is net productive. Yeah. And uh, but we over a lifetime, the, everything that we consume and excrete is greater than the organizational. Well, here's the structure deal. So, so, so a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, we're getting all this energy from the sun. That's not true. Okay, so we get a certain amount of energy from the sun and we export a certain amount of energy. You know what the ratio is? One. We export as much energy as we get from the sun. So, how is things going on? And, and some guys, some usually guys I could tell you about, Popovich down at the University of... Uh, Utah, they started doing telemetry on organisms. Because you see, you're saying, oh, energy in, energy out. The reason I'm running on energy? No, you're not. I don't know how you're running, but you're not running on energy. Because the energy in and the energy out, I mean, they're doing it on organisms. Energy in, energy out, absolutely equal. Now, I'm not telling you the answer to that, but that's, you should find that's that. That's the next lecture. You should find that a little bit disturbing, maybe.